Hindi, sabi mo sa house ko, group ko. Ako ba yung first time, OBG? OBG, mga last ko po. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, virtually. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Ako ba yung sabi? डिपार्टमेंट अफ इंगलिस भट्टाचार्यारेज मुर्शिदाबाद I now request principal of the college and chief patron of the online lecture series, Dr. Hena Sina, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning, good morning to all of you. At the very outset, I welcome you all to the fourth day of the online lecture series, organized by the Department of English, Bedampur Girls College. it goes without saying that the covid-19 pandemic situation has thrown new challenges to all the existing domains of the dissemination of knowledge in this respect the new circumstances have opened up fresh challenges to the teaching learning scenario our teachers are also adapting themselves as per the need of the hour and also trying to encourage our students to partake of the new technology driven system of education that remains the best way to stay connected with them at this hour of crisis students particularly of the rural and backward districts of west bengal are also faced with an unforeseen situation where the first generation learners are expected to immediately comply with the system of education with which they were only partially acquainted our institution has situa- our institution has started online teaching from the very first period of the closure of educational institutions we are complying with all the directives issued by the department of higher education government of west bengal and our affi- and our affiliating university university of kollam i congratulate the department of english for their noble initiative of arranging online lecture online lecture series for undergraduate and post graduate students of the department of our college in keeping with their course requirements as well as seeking knowledge beyond the existing domain i welcome the patron of the online lecture series professor boishali hui professor and head department of english university of kollani the department of english university of kollani has always guided us in our academic pursuits i welcome today's resource person professor obhijit bhattacharya assistant professor and head department of english and also head of the institution nabogram amorchand kundu college 
musidaban. Histok ay sincerely hope would open new dimensions of thought for the faculty and students alike. In this respect, I also appreciate the initiative taken by the teachers of the Department of English, the containers, organizing secretaries, and members. I therefore, without much delay, announce the opening of today's online lecture series. Thank you, Madam. May I now request uh, Dr. Boisali Hui, Professor and Head, Department of English, University of Kolani, to deliver the introductory address. Over to you, Madam. Uh, well, uh, as as the uh, well, to begin with, I must thank uh, the Department of English, uh, Bharatpur Girls College. Uh, um for this uh, you know for this initiative not just for inviting me which of course i am grateful to them for uh, but in addition to that also for this uh, you know what this very timely and necessary uh, initiative of organizing a lecture series for the uh, for the for the students of uh, the ug and uh, pg uh, levels uh, because this is as uh, the as the, as the principal madam has very uh, you know rightly pointed out we are moving to a phase of crisis and uh, uncertainty particularly because we uh, you know not just because we are uh, you know faced with this pandemic but also additionally because of the fact that this pandemic has brought us face to face with uh, you know with with certain uh, elements of uncertainty and certain, uh, you know, certain, certain um, unexplored domains that we are, you know, we have not faced, we have not, um, you know, confronted so far as it is. So, uh, uh, particularly with reference to the teacher-student relationship, the way we have all along been, uh, you know, accustomed to seeing our students in the class and classroom lecture and classroom interaction methods. So suddenly getting the whole thing transformed into this virtual mode where you cannot see your, you know, see the faces of the students, but you are expected to deliver lectures, hours together. Uh, there is very, you know, still I should say a very weak, uh, you know, uh, form of feedback uh, possible in this mode, etc. So the teachers and the students alike are facing a, uh, of course, are facing a difficult time. There is no doubt about that. But in uh, addition to that, I mean, in spite of that, uh, like uh, you know, like like many other institutions, that Bharampur Girls College is also, uh, you know, um, taking very positive steps in order to organize such lecture series or you know such other invited talks must be. Uh, on uh, you know on on um, syllabus related syllabus oriented topics of uh, UG and PG students and uh, that they are taking these uh, you know steps forward in order to enhance the uh, difficulties I mean sorry meaning enhance the um, possibilities of um, you know um, of, of learning for the students and mitigating the difficulties that they might be uh, facing and creating better opportunities creating uh, uh, greater opportunities for them to interact with their uh, teachers interact with um, you know uh, with with um, uh, knowledgeable people in the um, in different fields so this is uh, this is an initiative i should say that i am uh, you know i am i am um, i must uh, you know i must appreciate i am i am uh, very uh, you know thankful to them for and i am of course i am i am also i feel proud to be uh, in the Though uh, I mean this is part of the convention, but still I feel proud to be the patron in a in that sense uh, that from that academic perspective uh, of this whole um, you know program that they are organizing. So to Partho and um, 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 uh, the the two people I know personally and the others that I have not you know the other members of the faculty, uh, everybody must be uh, you know participating um, actively in the program so to all of them I extend my uh, appreciation uh, and I uh, you know I, I understand the way the students also must be grateful and must be uh, you know very glad that they are part of this uh, academic uh, you know fraternity of the college and of the uh, of the ambience that they might be must be sharing with uh, others so uh, this is uh, this is a this is a very happy occasion when uh, you know I am invited to uh, inaugurate uh, or 
sort of introduce this uh, lecture on post colonialism um, i welcome uh, the invited speaker um, obhijit uh, obhijit bhattacharya um, to this and uh, obhijit must be talking about a number of uh, you know very relevant necessary and important issues because particularly post colonialism being such a vast and wide uh, you know arena to discuss in an hour or um, so as it is so uh, you might be requiring more uh, you know class hours or lecture hours to discuss it to a uh, fuller or greater detail but nevertheless uh, i will just you know mention a few uh, important points uh, i mean or uh, i mean important issues that will be taken up during the course of the uh, lecture um, i'm sure so as i was um, Uh, as i was going through the ug um, you know syllabus on the basis of which particularly as i suppose this lecture series is organized uh, so there i could see that um, you know the students have both uh, um, both both um, literary pieces as well as uh, excerpts from uh, theory i mean books on of uh, on post colonial theory um, or you know such other uh, kind of seminal books by fano and others so uh, there there is as i as i expect and there should be a kind of a uh, you know common uh, i mean common arena of discussion where uh, theory and uh, uh, you know literature come to meet so um, there is uh, you know the moment that we talk about post colonialism generally as it is i am trying to you know trying to simplify simplify the expressions as much as possible because i basically understand that the whole thing is addressed to the students so uh, the the basic thing that i uh, you know believe post colonialism always tries to address uh, that always you know the the whole discourse on post colonialism always begins from an understanding of colonialism so what colonialism is and what the you know what the various ramifications the various um, you know actual as well as metaphorical um, you know representations or manifestations that we uh, see of post colonial of post colonialism in life and literature that is from where the whole uh, you know idea of post colonial um, you know discourse begins so um, this is therefore in a sense like 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 many other uh, you know theoretical perspectives post colonialism is also a theory of or theories of better say theories of resistance that have uh, developed with reference to uh, the specific um, crisis or difficulties or um, you know um, ideas that were um, you know that were developed that were uh, you know um, that were raised as a result of the coming in of colonialism so what colonialism stands for what colonialism is understood to signify uh, has a uh, you know has a lot to do with how we visualize how we um, you know talk about uh, or how you uh, how we you know um, uh, discuss the ideas of uh, post colonialism so uh, the moment that we say that post that post colonialism basically resists Uh, colonial aggression uh, we also at the same time accept that colonialism therefore basically um, is um, you know a discourse that focuses on the politics of um, you know control in a sense i should say so politics of control which is not just political political control is of course something that is very apparent very clear etc um, you know another country colonizing over and exerting political control over a colonized nation um, which is all very fine uh, but in addition to that that political control all the other kinds of control i mean which have become all the more significant for us in the post colonial uh, you know discourse uh, where society you know the whole social structure the social relationships how they are visualized uh, the whole of the economy of a you know of a nation money wealth economy in that sense money wealth and all the resources of a nation uh, the religious practices the religious institutions uh, the culture um, and language these two being very important in this whole discourse uh, and finally uh, the intelligentsia Uh, which which uh, relates also to the um, 
you know to the to the to the academic um, you know academic practice of a of a particular nation all these are um, you know all these are all these become very important so exerting control not just politically over a nation but also uh, economically um, socially uh, culturally linguistically trying to dominate and control a nation uh, for a long period of time is something that Uh, you know that that uh, that have uh, you know that has come to be understood as very very basically and simplistically speaking as colonialism and so uh, the uh, the uh, the idea remains that um, you know that that uh, uh, this this whole whole uh, trajectory of post colonial studies therefore uh, um, you know begins from and continues to follow the uh, follow the line of reclaiming Uh, the lost ground if we are you know if we can uh, use that phrase so the ground that you have lost in terms of you know your social identity your uh, religious distinction your uh, cultural or uh, you know um, a linguistic um, you know uh, singularities so reclaiming and establishing a you know distinct singular and unique identity of your own as a you know as a separate distinct sovereign nation is something that uh, these different uh, you know uh, politically decolonized nations are trying to do who are at this point of time at the different levels of their post colonial journey that is for example india in its own way india is following its own post colonial you know trajectory um, i mean in that in that order as it is so uh, these are the you know these are the basic issues where we have seen as with reference to india particularly as we can you know the which the students may also be able to connect more uh, closely uh, that uh, the moment that you uh, talk about this trajectory uh, this uh, subjugation political control leading to an you know acceptance of uh, the of the inferiority of the colonized as opposed to the superiority of the colonizer uh, leading further on to uh, uh, a level of identification of the of the uh, of the of the uh, you know identification of the colonized with the colonizer leading further on to an to to resistance to struggle for independence movements of um, you know movements of um, i mean leading to confrontation between the colonizer and colonized finally um, you know culminating into freedom struggle of uh, you know various wars of liberation in the different countries leading to the independence of these countries so if this is the trajectory this is the you know historical trajectory of a uh, 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 colonized nation finally uh, you know finally finally uh, becoming free finally politically speaking becoming free becoming a sovereign nation then this whole trajectory can be seen in these terms also that i mean what just now i referred to as uh, as a journey as as the as these colonized nations undergoing a journey undertaking a journey from uh, from from being under control under surveillance under uh, uh, you know under under uh, you know strict uh, you know certain strict norms and rules towards i mean and, and and you know trying to make a movement towards a freer world towards a uh, uh, you know towards a uh, towards a position towards a uh, you know towards a uh, towards a uh, uh, possibility towards a uh, uh, you know towards a uh, situation a context where they will be uh, they will be given the scope given the you know given the given the opportunity to speak their voices will be heard and their identity as a different separate distinct nation will be established will be uh, you know will be will be recognized by the other nations of the world so basically it, it therefore turns out to be a question of identity formation i mean reclaiming of identity and uh, you know developing of image as it is image building Uh, you know as as the very you know variously the theorists have pointed out so uh, well i uh, <laughs> i i i am going on to maybe i am going on to uh, you know discuss to a very great detail which uh, you know uh, which which i will have 
I'll, uh, you know, I'll have other occasions to talk about later on. So, uh, nevertheless, I will end here by, uh, you know, welcoming uh, Obhijit to uh, talk about uh, post-colonialism with reference to the texts and, um, you know, the, the uh, theoretical, um, you know, um, uh, texts that are and, and the literary texts that are, uh, you know, prescribed on the syllabus. So, um, and hope it's going to be an enlightening and useful and, uh, you know, lively, um, you know, um, discussion with the learners, with the students as it is. Um, I wish you all good luck and, uh, you know, a successful session today, not just today, but, uh, you know, uh, for the coming sessions also. Uh, and thank you again, Partho, and uh, thank you again, uh, Henadi, the principal, for inviting me. And, of course, all the other colleagues of uh, Partho, the whole Department of English, for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, to speak and uh, to be heard as it is by the students, which is always, a, you know, a very happy thing for a you know, for a, for a um, teacher anywhere uh, in the world. So, uh, thank you very much. And uh, maybe I won't be uh, there to, you know, to, to, to um, you know, listen out this whole session as it is. But I hope it's going to be a very useful one, very helpful uh, to the students, which we always aim to do. Uh, and uh, in future, maybe we will have other occasions to meet and talk as it is. So, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, happy session to you all. Thank you so much, madam. You have uh, addressed uh, post-colonialism and kind of uh, uh, given a very wholesome view of post-colonialism to our students. Uh, as of now, we, uh, as department, uh, we are now seven in number. Apart from Kiyadi and me, uh, there is Parthoprotim Mondol, there is Binoy Dangor, right. there is uh, right. Ipal Ansari, there is uh, Poel Ganguly, and there is Kajol Kumar Taha. So we are now a wholesome department. <laughs> which is very good, which is very good. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I always appreciate this also. Uh, and we always discuss that in the department, that you are a department, you know, as a whole, you work, you know, all of you work together and you are always, you know, uh, for all, particularly with reference to the PG courses that now, now you have, um, you know, opened, started and as a result of which we have, uh, you know, our interactions have also increased. So, um, you know, um, we, we do appreciate the work that you are doing. We do appreciate the, uh, you know, the, the um, relation that you are maintaining with the students and uh, the students also appear to be, uh, you know, happy, very happy with the, you know, college and the, the you know, activities of the department. So, um, well, uh, let's hope that uh, this uh, good relation that we have and the uh, good academic um, and then the useful and, the, you know, sort of very fruitful academic um, interaction that we have uh, that will continue in future also. Uh, and we will continue to meet like this. Yes. So thank you very much. And we are eager to uh, listen to you also as a resource person in the future. <laughs> Sure. The moment that I have a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, time, spare time out of the very busy schedule of my headship, which Hanadi must be, uh, you know, must understand. So uh, definitely, I will. I I love to, uh, you know, deliver events also for the department, uh, you know, students. So thank you very much. Okay. I'd, I'd like to take your link. You know. Thank you, madam. Right. Thank you so much. So, so I'd like to take your leave. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you, thank you very much. Today's uh, resource person is uh, Professor Obhijit Bhattacharya, who is presently working as an assistant professor and head of the Department of English, Nabogram Amokshad Kundu College, Mushidabad. He has completed his master's degree and entry from University of Calcutta and is presently pursuing his PhD degree from West Bengal State University. His area of research interests include partisan literature, translation studies, and feminism. I now request to Obhijit Bhattacharya to deliver his address. His topic is Being Postcolonial in 21st Century. Sir? Are you here? Hello. Oh. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes you are audible. Thank you. Uh, first of all, a very good morning to all present here. Very good morning to Principal Ma'am, 
good morning to the Kobal to Boishali Di, and a good morning to all the all my colleagues and my dear students. I'd like to first of all thank Partho and English Department and Madam for providing me with this opportunity to interact with the students. I, I must I have been a part of this uh, of this PG of, the, of this department since the inception of the PG section and. In my three and a half years of experience, I have one thing that I have noticed was, is the amount of discipline and dedication with which uh, the department is being run, and I feel quite I feel proud to be a part of this department, uh, giving my uh, whatever uh, bit of my expertise, sharing my expertise with the department, and uh, and I, I the more the less I give, the more I take from the department, and I try to implement those things in my department which which is run in a lesser setup and uh, so the, it's it's a kind of a very learning experience being a part of this department so uh, thank you for inviting me here so when partho uh, asked me to interact with the students regarding post colonial colonial theory and and the texts uh, the first thing i felt that it is it is such a huge uh, it, Huge field with such di with uh, with such diverse natures that it would be very difficult for me probably to interact with the students or to give them a, a kind of a broad view of uh, the of the topic within one and a half hours. Uh, but uh, but it it feel but after after a bit of introspection, I felt that it is very important to first understand that uh, what it is to be postcolonial. In 21st century, what it is to be post-colonial? What do we mean by post-colonial studies? Because if we see the post-colonial studies have evolved over the time, so now standing in 21st century in a 2021 class, uh, the UG students or the PG students, when they interact, they, when they take up post-colonial studies, how they are, uh, how, what kind of uh, uh, perspective they need to develop. So I uh, so I felt that this is uh, my my uh, topic of discussion would be to pro would be initially to track this uh, development or to the track this trajectory of the post-colonial thought from the from the early 1980s till 2021 and how it has changed over time and as a result of this change how our understanding of the post-colonial text because we have an entire paper in the new CBCS syllabus dedicated to post-colonial literature. So how our understanding of the, those texts will evolve uh, with, uh, with the newer post-colonial uh, tools of interpretation that we get over time. So that would be my first uh, focus of my discussion today. I relate to both the theories as well as a few of the texts, I guess, the students here are a bit acquainted with the texts that are there in the syllabus. I must first congratulate the department, the or the board of studies for select for the selection of the of the of the texts that are there, which uh, which encourages us to read in 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 ways which in newer ways. In, Text which to, on which we can implement the newer post-colonial ideas and interpret them in newer ways. So I must congratulate the department, uh, the board of studies, for coming up with such a wonderful uh, bouquet of texts for the students. Now, uh, for, to, be, to start on a lighter note, when Partho said that the day, uh, that the this academic uh, this lecture series would be taking place on sunday i felt that uh, that the very this very idea is pretty post colonial because the in the religion of the colonizer sunday refers to a time when, when even the lot was resting when when the god was resting so we have uh, in this in our attempt to indulge in this academic endeavor on sunday the very thing is pretty post colonial so, so starting from that, what is post-colonial? So what, what are the things that we call as post-colonial is something that we need to first focus on. Uh, 
Now coming to when we as Boishaliti has uh, Boishaliti has already already introduced uh, in her, in her lecture. Uh, I have I, I was not able to hear a bit of it because of some internet problems here. Postcolonialism can be said to be a kind of a critique of the uh, of the of colonialism of the ideas or the discourses that were prevalent in colonialism. So. Uh, and in and it started evolving in the 1980s. If we see 1970, late 1970s, early 1980s, if we consider uh, the publication of Edward Said's Orientalism to be the start of the theoretical beginning of postcolonial studies, we say in 1980s there emerged this entire uh, interest in postcolonial studies, and which have swept the academics in the in the in the coming 20 years. So this was actually a kind of a, uh, as Bill Ashcroft has said, that it was it is a, it was a kind of desire. It was a desire to uh, uh, to include diversity of thought, include diversity of thought, to uh, uh, to look at the global from the from the perspective of the local. So that th this desire to have diverse thoughts, diverse perspective, to bring diverse thoughts and diverse perspectives, which would challenge the Eurocentric, European, European, European-centered thoughts or ideologies, that led to the emergence of postcolonialism. Now, uh, so before, uh, and it has evolved over the time. We are. Uh, we are now, if we look at the time, that it is the term post-colonial. There has been a much debate about the term this post-colonial. What is this post-colonialism? And uh, I pretty prefer to the I prefer, I I will stick to the idea that post-colonial is not something that we call simply call as uh, post-independence or after colonialism. It's not something that it's not something that is connected to post-independence of the colonized uh, countries or after colonialism it rather refers to the uh, to the ideas to the thoughts to the discourses that that was a result of colonialism and that was uh, that was imposed upon the uh, the colonized world and the as a result and the discrimination involved in, in, in those discourses, a study, a critique of those discriminations, a, a, a critique of those, uh, those inequalities that were there in the, in the, in the discourse of colonialism, which, which, are, which are not actually uh, over after the, the, uh, the so-called political colonialism over, but had stayed in different ways, in, in different manner, over the centuries, even even now, so that is something that we need to focus on. And what I what what, uh, what I need to in a less in a lesser jargonistic way was colonialism. If you see, has created a structure. Colonialism is built on a structure, a structure that is uh, dependent on a very strong center and a margin or a periphery. So this center margin pay periphery is something that, and is something that is very integral, very uh, connected to the post-colonial theory, and post uh, and in colonialism we find, and in colonial circumstances we find a kind of interaction between the center and the periphery. The center controls, the, and uh, the margin, the, the people in the margins are con uh, are controlled by the center. So this center margin periphery is something that is uh, that is of much importance in the post-colonial theory. Now, uh, what are what was uh, what what were we critiquing? We were critiquing uh, we are critiquing here the idea of colonialism and the impact of colonialism on the world. So, if we so we need to go a bit back to what is colonialism. Uh, colonialism uh, often is imagined to be a part, to be a, almost a byproduct of what is called European modernity. European modernity, as yes, European modernity, which 
we can date back to something to the 15th and the 16th century. And during that time, what happens is uh, there is a kind of a newer concept of time. Four things basically happen. One is uh, a new concept of time. New concept of time, bolte, the concept of the clock time, which was there, which is integrally connected with the industrial industrial revolution or the industries where you fix, you have fixed times, you're bound by the clock time. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, audible. Okay. Uh, so, first was the, it was this clock time. The second was a kind of a uh, newer professions coming up. Newer professions, distinctive professional uh, specializations of job. Next was the the newer idea, the new idea of space. That that was a part of the fifteenth and the sixteenth century. If you look at the entire concept of the map making that came into existence. And with the idea of map making, uh, the idea of space was revolutionized. The idea of space was revolutionized. Every day the map was changing. If you remember your Dan, uh, John Dunn's poetry, you will remember what it means to have world on walls have drawn, have been drawn. So the map was being constructed. There was a kind of a, a, a labor force that was being created and organized. And as a result of this, what happened was the what happened was the was an optimal use of resources, which led to maximum profits. And now the aim of the European modernity was a kind was connected to a kind of a uh, a kind of capitalist mode of production, which aimed at optimum use of resources and and uh, uh, op and maximization of profits. Now, this increased production needed a market to be uh, to get uh, to get uh, it required a newer market and it required a wider market. And as a result of it, they looked for newer pastures. So, and you had that in the East. And so, with this modernity, directly led to voyages of discovery, to conquests, conquests because. Uh, they realize once they reach these places, they realize that these were the places where they will not, where you will not only find market, but also it was a rich storehouse of raw materials which could be used and uh, for for greater production, and as a result of to maximize profits. So it was colonialism in that sense was a process uh, of uh, was strongly connected with the economic. Uh, had an economic aspect to it, and it was, and and, and with that, a uh, strong concept of exploitation. Uh, famously, this was uh, the amount of it, uh, or the degree of such exploitation. Exploitation is made clear. Uh, has been uh, has been made clear. Has been made clear by Sashi Tharoor in one of his famous Oxford lectures. If you have seen it, it because it it had become viral in the YouTube, and he has also written a book on it called Era of Darkness. Shekhar Ami Bolson, he's saying that uh, when the Britishers came to India, they were, India was, uh, uh, was almost producing 23% of the world's product, world's goods. And after that, it was reduced to almost 4%. So see how they have captured this place and they have exploited the, man, 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 the amount of exploitation he goes on to say again that when before before the uh, before the Britishers came to India, India was producing almost 27 percent of uh, the world's clothes because the Indian Indian Muslim Indian silk was like was world famous. When they came, the first thing they did was to destroy these mills and uh, import, uh, and as a result of it, the entire industry was driven was destroyed, and England sold their, their clothes to India. So from greatest exporters, India became the greatest import, one of the most important importers of clothes. So this was this kind of destruction 
was happened he goes on to say what kind of uh, you what 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 amount of money was what amount of money was drawn out of the nation during the first world war and the second world war and how india was uh, was economically exploited in a big way so colonialism is in that sense of the term is connected with west modernity it is connected with exploitation it is connected with capitalist mode of production now parallelly when they came during this time when they came to if africa asia and south america to establish their colonies what happened historically this era of western modernity is connected with that of colonial modernity in uh, in in the colonized nations and colonial modernity uh, refers to the uh, to uh, to a kind of what is called a process of settlement of the europeans in asia africa and south american territories and uh, and a kind of a racial discrimination where the where the whites or the non natives became more powerful were considered to be more powerful uh, uh, than the natives and this kind of a, and this structure the structure of colonial domination that we are talking about where there is a kind of the colonized who is the powerful and the colonizer who is the powerful and colonized who is the powerless or uh, this kind of a structure of colonial domination uh, was based on a concept of racial, racial superiority and this was established this is where we first have a uh, where we get have gets a connection with our syllabus here so how was this how was uh, the first question that arises here is why uh, how the britishers how the europeans were able to establish this view that the non natives are powerful and the natives of the nation are powerless or they are superior than the natives this was established as we see this could not could, have, could not have been a result of mere military and economic involvement so through military and economic powers would not would not have guaranteed would not have guaranteed such a kind of a control so there was something more to it and this was as has been seen by the post colonialists it was it was a kind of a complex what he calls a complex dynamics of representation and discourse what does this mean representation and discourse it means that it refers to the way the east the colonized the, col the colonized nations were portrayed and this portrayal was uh, was reiterated was repeated over and over to make to get make those ideas stronger and to make those those notions a kind of a truth so this and, and this was done through a very complex process so so we can say if we look at this perspective so it was not merely a military project colonialism was not merely a military project but a kind of a uh, ideological project if we look at if you use the term ideological pro project or a kind of a, a cultural project where you yourself when the colonized himself himself or herself starts believing that the europeans are more powerful so this structure so as and this structure led to a kind of a, a creation of binaries where the colonizer is stood at the center of attraction at the center of the helm of affairs and the non native and the natives were pushed to the periphery or the margins so this was the structure that that was established by colonialism this structure started getting a bit criticized initially this uh, the post colonialism actually attempts a kind of a critique attempts a kind of a critique critique of such representation representation that are they, that were there in history writing of the time the way the history of the colonized period was being written literature of the time religion educational practices which were involved the religion that was introduced when these these were the areas which the post colonial the post colonial critics started 
questioning. So they were actually questioning the, the, uh, the view that was established by the colonialism. They were trying to get uh, look at this entire complex relationship of the colonizer and the colonized from the perspective of the colonized. So they were trying to reverse the gaze, if you will. It was now this entire case was reversed. So this was the first attempt of the post-colonials, post-colonial critics. It started, we, we take, uh, uh, for our starting point, often we use, uh, we take Edward Said's Orientalism to be the, uh, to be one of the most influential books that led to a kind of a uh, surge of in post-colonial studies and which stepped the academics in the coming 40, almost 50 years. So, but uh, if we look at it, we, we can even go before, if we just go before uh, Orientalism, we'll find that the ideas of post-colonialism was, was, was starting shape, was starting to get shape in Mahatma Gandhi, uh, anti-colonial struggle in India. It was getting a shape in M.S. Isaiah's people, uh, writings and his and, and his view and, and views of MS is there. And for, for example, if Mahat, you have Mahatma Gandhi in your syllabus, uh, I think there are there are excerpts from Mahatma Gandhi's Swaraj uh, in your text as a part of your syllabus. And we find that Gandhi first introduces the concept of a kind of a moral resistance to the colonizer. So in uh, and what was this? This was a concept of passive resistance that he calls a passive resistance in in front of an aggressive masculine uh, colonial power against an aggressive masculine colonial power. You have a kind of a moral passive resistance, a kind of a non-violence, which was distinctly uh, distinctly uh, uh, involved the morals of the colonized. So this was, he, he started first challenging the, uh, the aggressive uh, British colonial powers with a kind of a non-passive resistance and non ideas of passive resistance and non-violence. And as a result of this, Gandhi was, uh, in his, almost you can see in Gandhi's works, we find a first kind of a theorization of the resistance or a critique of the British powers uh, of the of the of, of British colonialism. Later on, uh, it, similarly, they were quite. Uh, if, if we move on uh, after Mahatma Gandhi, we can look at another. Uh, we need to look at another important uh, theoretician. Theoretician who emerges and in, uh, and introduces the post-colonial theory in a big way was called Franz Fanon. Uh, I guess we don't have a text of, uh, we don't have excerpts from that. Uh, uh, the two texts that becomes very important was is one, the wretched of the earth. One was the wretched of the earth, and the other was black skins and white masks. Black skins, white masks. One written sometime in in 1963, and the other in 1967. This this is a book uh, written in, in context of Algeria. Uh, and it's French colonial occupation. So the impact of French colonial occupation on Algeria was something that was discussed. And Fano was himself extremely fascinated by the psychological impact of colonialism and the impact that was there both on the colonizer and the colonized. Colonizer impact colonized impact. Bruno was trying to theorize that, and he argued that he was. He, he started arguing that uh, the repressed and the suffering native, which emerged from the system, uh, the, found his soul to be destroyed. So the native soul was destroyed because uh, the the masters, the colonizers started looking at, at, the, at these natives as non-human, animalized, 
them, animalized them, and almost uh, disregarded the identity uh, of a specific identity of the native. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, uh, at the same time, interestingly, at the same time, they were also uh, looked at as something exotic. But they were not, they are considered to be almost subhuman. You find the classic example of it if you have read, if you, uh, PG students probably have read uh, The Heart of Darkness and will find uh, how uh, Conrad talks about the natives in his text, hardly considers them to be human. So here the black, uh, he sees that what happens to the black man, what happens to the native when this kind of a thing happens, he loses his sense of self and identity. As uh, and this and this eraser of self and identity happens because he he sees himself through the eyes of the white man. He sees himself through the eyes of the white man. He internalizes the belief that he is some he, he belongs to a culture which is degraded. He is almost subhuman. He is always the negative. He, he always stands for the primitive. He always stands for that other, the very opposite of uh, uh, the exact opposite to the European culture. So, as a result of this, what the native feels that what he as a result of it, what happens is the native feels that the only way of dealing with this insecurity. In dealing with this feeling of uh, inferiority is to is trying is is to try to be white as possible. What does this mean? Trying to be white as possible. It means to take up West. First thing that means the natives. If you look at both the Indian context and the British context, we find that uh, and the African context, we find that the natives. Uh, in order to rise up the ladder of importance, adopted Western values, adopted Western religion, started using, uh, uh, if we have, starting, the, starting learning the language of the Europeans, and uh, started practicing the uh, white colonial uh, attitudes and the practice uh, and the uh, nature, the style, the style of the white white colonial life, and this led to and, and, and as a result of that, they started rejecting his own traditions. So this was happening. But what happens? The, but uh, as Fano says, that uh, uses the term that he uses. What he does, the colonized actually use is takes up a mask, mask of the white man. So the black man in order to rise up the ladder of the society in order to get rid of his inferiority what he does he takes up uh, the uh, he takes up a mask which is basically that of the white man and tries to fit himself into it but the problem is you can uh, you can hardly fit in it and as a result of it fano uses a term that the native experience is a kind of a, a schizophrenic condition. He, he experiences kind of kind of a schizophrenic condition and a kind of a duality. And this is uh, I will uh, I, I I would here request uh, all of you to have a have a kind of a imagine uh, try to understand this theory and try to put it in a context of such a, a book like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. And uh, in Things Fall Apart, uh, in the Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, we, we see that uh, Chinua Achebe talks about, uh, about a native African community, the Igbo community, who, which, is, which follows a kind of a primitive polytheistic religion, and uh, how that community gets dispersed, gets destroyed, gets corrupted by the presence of the colonial powers. And we find that, we find uh, the interesting section is the part when, uh, in the part, in part two of the book, where we find the 
emergence, the coming of the uh, of the missionaries, the coming of the Christianity, as was in uh, all uh, most of the British colonized nations. Uh, Colonial, the religion was came hand in hand with the colonial the military powers and we find that we find the confusion we I, I request you to look at the confusion in the minds of the first generation uh, converts in case of in continue attributes no other say. The, the son of Okonko, who gets attracted to the Christian religion, to, to, to this Christianity. And he is not attracted because of, uh, the, I'll come to the reasons why he gets so attracted, why he, he finds it so attractive. There is a reason behind it, but he finds attractive. But this new religion, the way he wants to be a part of that new religion is very unique. The negotiation that no one knew or does is something that we need to focus on. So how how he fits into this in order to rise up, in order to be of importance, how he tries to adopt the Western uh, the Western ideas, the Western way of living, the Western culture, the Western religion. So that is something that is uh, uh, that uh, that is what actually Franz Fanon sees. Moving on to uh, so. Fenno recognized that it was important in this way, that it was important uh, that a kind of a cultural nationalism, kind of a cultural nationalism, a kind of a national literature and a national culture needs to be, pro needs, needs to be promoted, which would lead to a kind of a national consciousness, a kind of consciousness of the native, and that would try to question the white uh, the Eurocentric view that 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 was that is prevalent in this guy in these colonies. So he, he he focuses on a kind of a national culture that needs to be developed, uh, and he actually stresses three stages in this. Kibabe development of national culture, the development He says that the native intellectual, in the first case, the native intellectual is under the influence of the colonizer's culture and tries to uh, emulate and assimilate it by uh, abandoning some ideas of his own. Next, the native, uh, in a way, in other words, you can say the native tries to be as white as possible. Then comes the second stage where the native is discovers that he can never uh, become truly white. So you can never become truly white and uh, or white enough to be a colonized, uh, to be a colonial master. So white enough that he will be treated equally as, a col as the colonial master is treated. So the native intellectual now again returns to study of his uh, native culture. And initially it is a kind of a, uh, uh, not a very kind of a, this attempt is happens in the form of a romanticization of the past without a kind of a very uncritical engagement with the native cultures. The Protomajataha is a kind of a celebration. And finally, there comes a finally we have that stage, the third stage, where the native intellectual becomes a kind of truly anti-colonial colonial. Where he joins a, he joins his own people and he he gives a careful analysis of his own culture he does a careful analysis of his culture culture uh, he is uh, ready to abandon those elements of the native culture which seems dated or oppressive and uh, and talks about a new future that can that is possible beyond the clutches of the colonialism so this is what Fanu talks about this kind of evolution of the native and a growth of the national culture that can happen, that needs to happen in order to uh, arrest, in order to resist the colonial powers and to and stop this 
entire domination through this to a very this to an act of discrimination so this is what fano talks about so that fano uh, after fano comes uh, in a big way in a very celebratory way we have the coming of we have the emergence of edward said Edward Said, in his Orientalism, Orientalism, a book written in some time, written in 1978, is considered is still considered to be one of the most uh, celebratory, most influential books of the modern era. And uh, this Orientalism came hand in hand uh, uh, when, in the if you look into into the Western intellectual arena, we have people like with the emergence of. Uh, people like derida fuko uh, we have uh, the the books of the, the writings of althusser get getting popular the french feminists coming in so this was the intellectual milieu in in which edward said was writing his orientalism and all these critical views established by these people uh, got a uh, was got into the text in, a, in in interesting ways rather you can say that uh, science orientalism uh, interacted with this text in diver in the, with other critical theoretical texts in interesting ways uh, edward said saw colonialism uh, as a kind of a project a project which was on one hand it was military and political but it was also on the other hand it was a kind of a literary discursive creation it was a it was also a kind of a literary discursive creation it also involved a, it was a kind of a literary discursive project where a new knowledge of regarding the east was created so this was something so uh, and this knowledge was created dispersed repeated and to make it canonical or to make it to establish it as the only way of looking at the old so uh, edward said says edward says uh, see uh, edward says feels says that orient is actually a creation orient is actually a creation of the occident of the of uh, so this is not something that was there, that was uh, that is there but something that is created by a kind of a uh, uh, concerted effort of uh, in the field of archaeology in the field of literature in the field of history in the field of music in the field of ethnography in different ways east was created east was formulated east was met in a certain way so what uses a term called epistemology epistemology means knowledge so it was an epistemological project it was not merely a military or a power political project but also an epistemological project so uh, orientalism according to him was created in such a way that uh this was created in a certain certain specific technique first the europeans uh, had in their minds a kind of a uh, idea of hindu or islamic systems with which uh, uh, and and the way they thought so this was there previously in their mind so european now the european traveler who goes to these places connect collects some uh, notes about these native cultures and these notes that they collect about the natives they try to interpret this uh, interpret them uh, from their uh, what they call uh, from what from their preconceived notions so they interpret those notes from their preconceived notions and uh, established and this interpretation the european interpretation become the standard way of reading uh, the orient and these readings are then actively connected with the uh, political acts of the colonizer 
সো এই এই প্রসেস প্রথমে একটা ইউরোপ ইউরোপ ইস্ট নিয়ে একটা ভাবনা সে ভাবনাটা নিয়ে সে আসছে সে নোটস কালেক্ট করছে আফটার কালেক্টিং দ্য নোটস হি ইজ ট্রাই টু ইন্টারপ্রেট দেন ইন্টারপ্রেট দেন অ্যাকর্ডিং টু হিজ ওন এস্টাবলিশ থটস অ্যান্ড আইডিয়াস অ্যান্ড দেন দে কনসিডার দিস ইন্টারপ্রিটেশন দে মেক ইট শিওর দ্যাট দেয়ার ইন্টারপ্রিটেশন আর দ্য ওনলি ইন্টারপ্রিটেশন পসিবল and as a result of this interpretations the connect this interpretation this cultural understanding of the of the orient with the political acts with the political with the political domination and therefore the and so this oriental discourse oriental discourse in this way actually moves from a kind of an imaginative space bhavna theke eta kintu administrative manifestation so let's say so from from a yeah i come there's a question that has come i will just there is the language of colonization it's quite a process Okay, so Doer has talked, uh, has raised a question regarding the use of language in things for the part. And how the, how the language of colonization, how Chinua actually uses English language, the language of the colonizer, to talk about the traumatic experience of the, of the colonized. I'll come to that. I'll have with that in mind. I'll come to your question. Wonderful question. I'll come to it later on. We'll just finish. I'll, I'll, uh, while discussing things for the part i'll come to that section for sure uh, what happens was this this uh, so the so i so according to edward said the idea of the orient the oriental is discourse moves from a kind of, from the level of imagination to the level of an event from a kind of a thought to kind of, to ha, to ha, to Uh, to a point where it it starts having administrative manifestations so uh, now in this kind of a circumstances when this is established said uh, argues that the uh, that the european identity uh, in the 18th and the 19th century uh, if you look at the european identity which is basically identity of the colonizer established to a kind of a uh, engagement with the other with the non european so it was connected it was strongly connected with the uh, or with the with the non with the natives so the manner in which they looked at the native in in response to that their identity was created so if you uh, the, the european was what was everything that the that the that the non european was not so it was very important to this binary between the colonizer and the colonized the colonizer colonized in modde je phara this was very important according to uh, according to edward said because and a repetition of it was important for the uh, uh, for this for for their superiority to remain intact in order to be superior in order to be in order to continue to be superior this kind of a demarcation this kind of a binary was was extremely important and uh, and keeping in keeping this in mind uh, the, the primitive or the other or the uh, colonized or the natives were were imagined talked about written down in literature uh, defined in literature uh, defined in anthropological writings ethnographic writings so that the col- the colonized would be would be equal to kind of a primitive uh, uncivilized feminine while the colonizer would, would be the uh, masculine civilized rational so this kind of a definition was established through an orientalist discourse and uh, promoted 
so this was uh, and this structure uh, this this way of looking at the orient was extremely it was extremely helpful in uh, for the post colonial critics while the red started reading texts and uh, in case of even in case of as we said in case of things fall apart we find this kind of a uh, description where uh, where we find that the that this the colonizer and the colonized interaction is based on how they are different from the other this difference is the the reason why the colonizer could control the colonizer the difference was established and as and with that difference the fact that the colonizer is superior and the colonized are inferior was established so this was the entire structure so uh, this kind of a structure this kind of a uh, this kind of a thought process needs to be critiqued by the post colonial reader the post, when you read it, we do a, when you do a kind of a post colonial reading of the text we are trying to critique this kind of a structure where uh, the colonizer is at the center is the is one who is powerful and the colonized is at the periphery is on is on the borders who are powerless now edward sides if you look at edward sides works one of the one of the critique one of the criticism that edward side had to face was between basically two things one was he what he did was a kind of a uh, homo he, he imagined the kind of a homogeneous colonial colonialism so the manner in which colonialism worked he felt he was of the opinion that it happened in a in a similar way in different places so he was not able to imagine or he was not able to give us a concept of a kind of a heterogeneous colonial processes or uh, because colonialism did not happen in the manner in uh, did not happen in the same manner in different colonies the way it happened in india was just is just was distinctly different from the way it happened in say latin america or in Afri africa or in america uh, or in australia or new zealand so this kind of different colonialism so it is it was not a kind of a colonialism but a, but colonialisms that was uh, that was not imagined by uh, by edward said another thing that was uh, that was missing or that was uh, or we can say kind of a theoretical flaw in edward said's working was the fact that he did not he felt he did not recognize that the colonized can have an agency the modes of resistance that the colonized might possess that breaks the entire post colonial discourse that that has the potential to break the post colonial discourse ekhane shudhu power ta unilinear mane ek dikhe jacche kintu mane like the colonizer is powerless powerful and the colonized does not have any voice does cannot have any voice cannot have any resistance cannot show any resistance so it was a kind of a uh, so he edward said's concept of orientalism was a kind of uh, a kind of a structure where the power the, the movement of the power was in one direction so one was the powerful and one was the powerless and the powerless had no no almost no means to resist so this was something that uh, becomes a point of concern now uh, in uh, this was raised uh, with, the, with with this question was this question or this flaw was rather explained later explained by uh, or or uh, was analyzed by homi bhava so from uh, so we come uh, we just move from gandhi to uh, to safano to uh, orientalism edward said and from there let's move on to bhava what does bhava say and how post colonialism either post colonialism evolves homi bhava in his essay called the location of culture so we are talking about so we go and enter into 200 uh, 2007 in 2007 this uh, uh which is sometime like 
probably in 2007, not, not in 2007, it was probably in nine, late 200, 2000, 2000, 2000, uh, I just am not very sure about the date. Sometime during this time, the last half of the 20th century, 20th century he talks about the, the a kind of a, what we call uh, the, he feels that the, that the concept of this, the, this colonial structure, the identity, you can think well about how did colonial affect the equal right? Okay, how did colonialism affect the equal Fine, I'll come to that. I'll come to that things for the part. So if we look at uh, what happens, he says that this uh, the concept of the uh, uh, the identity of the colonizer is always in a flux. Is always in a flux, and the I and the discourse of the colonialism is fractured. Is fractured uh, in a in different ways. The subject, the colonial subject, the identity of the colonial colonial subject is always is always in a transitional uh, phase what he what does he mean by that that he feels that there is the uh, the colonizer and the colonized are uh, it's not a, the structure of the colonizer and the colonized are not is not monolithic right? uh, and this, what, what do we mean by monolithic? That there is the, the, the flow of power is not really from one only from one one side to the other, from the colonizer to the colonized. There are many ways in which this uh, there there are ambivalences that take place. For example, he talks about uh, what happened. He gives an example of how when the Christian religion Christianity one of the major uh, forces. Through which colonialism was established, a Christianity Japan introduced in a, through the Bible, and the Bible uh, was introduced in this native culture, and the way the natives negotiated that new religion in their own way, the way Christianity was negotiated by the colonial by the colonizers, led to a change, led to a kind of a uh, change in the nature of the lack of the religion of the colonizers. The manner in which Christianity was there in England and the manner in which the Christianity spread in India or in Africa is distinctly different. So, and this difference happens because the colonized imparts a kind of a force and changes the concept of the colonizer. So here, we in, 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 if in, if in this context, we find that the colonized have a, uh, can have a strong influence, can have a strong influence over the discourse of the colonizer. If Christianity is, a, is something that is, that belongs to Christianity, uh, to, to the colonizer, something that is pure, it is the, it is, the, it is through the interaction with the colonized that that religion gets changed, that concept gets changed. So that is something uh, that he talked about in location of culture. And so this is the ambivalence that he talks about basically, he uses the term ambivalence. He, there, he then talks about now the native subject, he then focuses on the native subject and this is, uh, this becomes very important, this native sub, who is this native subject? Under the influence of the uh, of the colonize, colonizers, culture and religion, what happens to this native subject? A native subject, the native subject who who is exposed to the to the culture of the colonizer, to the education involved uh, introduced by the colonizer, he in fact starts behaving like a colonizer. So he, this he talks, he uses the term mimic, he mimics the colonizer and a kind of a, and he starts mimicking the colonizer and the moment he starts mimicking the colonizer, he starts talking like a colonizer, he starts uh, thinking logically like a colonizer, he actually stands on the line that divides the colonizer and the colonizer. 
and erases that line. But if we look into uh, the concept of the Orientalism as given by Edward Said, that line of demarcation is, is extremely crucial, is extremely crucial for, for the colonial powers to exist. So Baba says this mimicry, this mimicry of the Europeans, mimicry of the of, of the of the Europeans actually ruptures the colonial discourse. This ruptures the colonial discourse and uh, and as a result we have a kind of a uh, kind of an anxiety that grows in the mind of the colonizers. And we have a creation of a hybrid space, this third space that grows. Colonizer, colonized, you know, Bhava include, in, in, includes within, within it the concept of the third space, the space of the, uh, the space where the, where this, uh, where, uh, where this kind of people who are, who are well educated in the language of the colonized, who are well educated in the language uh, of the language of the colonizer, who knows the ways of the colonizer can think like a colonizer, but yet not a colonizer. So he is in he is like white, but not white. That is the place which ruptures the entire colonial discourse, and that creates a kind of resistance. Uh, here I'll come to the question of Doel Shah. Doel Shah was talking, has given a, as she's asked a question that the things fall apart. We see that Chinua actually has used the language of colonizer colonization to describe the adverse effect of colonization. So she wants to mean that uh, he was uh, uh, things in terms fall apart. Uh, Chinua HEB was writing in English and he was using the language of the colonizer to critique the effect of colonization in Africa. Truly right. So we can consider uh, now if we look at Chino HEB, Chino HEB is actually uh, a poem. if we look at uh, uh, he Chino HEB here uses the he is well versed in the language of the colonizer and with using that very language he is critiquing he is critiquing the colonizer. Uh, colonizers work is is colonizers uh, uh, mode of explore domination the type of domination that they ha had over the uh, th they had over over africa so because he resides on that line he has he he he, 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 belo he belongs to that hybrid space by belonging in that hybrid space he is he has the ability he has the ability to uh, to question, to interrogate, to uh, uh, just hold on, to inter, to interrogate the colonizer, to inter interrogate the entire power of colonial, the colonial, colonial, the colonizer, and give us a critique of the uh, of the colonial policies. So you can say that it is his the using of this language. This was. Uh, but if, our, if you look into an Indian context, this is what actually Raja Ramon Rai also did in a more, in a far more. Uh, Raja Ramon Rai is actually has been uh, the, uh, his treatise on Sati. If we uh, if we see, was can be seen as one of the first early writings in Indian writing uh, in the field of Indian writing in English, where he uses the English language like the English man to express his views, to express his ideas, and almost dictate the way the colonizer acts. So this use of language of the colonization, colonizer is, can be used as a tool. And, uh, and that is what Chino Achebe does in the novel. Now, coming to, at this point of time, if you come to uh, things fall apart, uh, we have the book, I'll just get my book. And things fall apart. If we look at things fall apart, it is uh, we at the beginning we get a picture of a uh, uh, of the main protagonist of the novel called Okonko, a great warrior who belongs to the Igbo tribe. 
who establishes his uh, uh, who is a uh, who asserts his superiority through his power through his physical prowess becomes one of the uh, uh, becomes one of the most powerful among among his tribes but uh, in his act of rage because uh, his 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 fierceness leads to his downfall in a certain way where he kills his adopted uh, the he kills uh, his own plains clansman a boy whom he adopted and uh, and after that there there comes a crisis in akonko's life where he is abandoned from his uh, he is thrown out he, he, from his own clan he had to spend spend 7 years outside his own village and when and it was during this time when he is remaining uh, when he is staying away from his own space own, own land that christianity comes in. so at the end by the middle of the book we have the introduction of colonialism in the form of religion so we have we it chinoyati is things fall apart gives us a classic example of a of a situation where the churchman come before the military military so where uh, this is an a classic example where we have a kind of a cultural the, 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 we find a kind of a cultural induction rather than a forced military project so and often we find that how this uh, uh, this and this promotion of the religion is as uh, is is con continuously monitored and controlled by uh, by the gun we find at the very beginning we find that how uh, when one was being when the when the fur when the cycle man who came with the uh, the uh, the bishop who came in a cycle was captured and killed and that bicycle was being uh, tethered to a tree then the people, then the, then we find a group of white men coming and destroying the village so we find that how religion and military power or religion and administration goes hand in hand in chinoyati this no now uh, chinoyati uh, if you look at it's very important in fact when we talk about post colonial studies or when we interact with the text which we consider post colonial to look at the positioning of the uh, author concern so if we look at the positioning here of the author the sub we, we call use use the term subject position actually right? subject position if we look at the subject position of uh, of chinua chib uh, who is writing the text if we look at him and we have uh, a basic idea about chinua chib's life we realize that he is he belongs to a uh, in in fact if you look at him he belongs to the first of the converts he was himself converted to christianity uh, he was in university uh, he was uh, he was well versed in the uh, in this in the language of the colonizer because he was in university graduate he started teaching there so uh, his academics and Uh, his religious background is interestingly uh, aligns him in a way to that of the colonizer and interestingly if we have a uh, if we look at the story of uh, the things fall apart or how the trilogy if you, uh, it is the first of the three books that he has written the african trilogy that we call about this the uh, this actually uh, in a way is uh, the uh, the way he deals with christianity seems to be pretty interesting i be, i'll request you to focus uh, while reading the text I, i i request you to focus on the manner in which this uh, uh, the introduction of christianity is looked at by chinua 
he does not uh, while talking about christianity he does not he does not uh, actually consider it to be something that is evil that is something that that that, that is a, one something that is destroying in a big way the fabric of a, an otherwise ideal society or ideal culture that is something that is interesting to uh, note and i i was interesting be connected i was interested while reading you know actually be i was at the same time thinking about the way uh, william carries uh, william carry diary by written by komothanath bishi in where uh, komothanath to almost talks in a kind of a, a kinds of in a, in a negative way regarding the process of conversion here there is a very interesting in the in the beginning if we look at the first half of things for a part we find that we get an elaborate description of the religion the religion of the igbo community and uh, we find that this religion is based on two things one is that of fear and one is that of acceptance you cannot question and there is hardly any aspect of tolerance there so the gods that are there are uh, we can see they are marked uh, the gods are often angry on the people they are uh, and the people hardly have any uh, can hardly resist uh, hardly have any voice can uh, question the might of the of this primitive gods we have an elaborate polytheistic religion here we find two cases uh, and it is almost it 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 acts through development of of fear in the mind of uh, in the mind of the of the tribes another thing that is very very clear and clear about this identity of the igbo uh, igbo community is the fact that it does not have space for those who are different those who are different those who are uh, uh, those those who does not follow the norms of the community for example the the son of a konko who is not man enough is always looked down upon by a konko is always uh, uh, challenge is always questioned he is always he is being ridiculed and this marginalization is there was is there was there even in the igbo community so when the religion comes in when christianity comes in we find the first people who get attracted who get first people who get gets attracted to the christian religion are those who are considered to be who were considered to be not good enough for the community they were the first those who were outcasts they were the one who started adopting this new religion uh, where they found a kind of a greater tolerance and as a result of which they started taking up that religion that though the religion though they And, and while they, they were taking up the religion, it was interesting. He mentions in the text that there are people who are following this religion and at the same time going and indulging in the feasts. They are doing both the things. So this is again a kind of a third space that was created. So we always talk about Christian Christianity as a colonial tool that was imposed upon. the colonizers on the colonized but one thing that we fail to notice and which is pretty noticeable in the text is the fact that how even christianity which is which comes from the colonizers land gets post colonized in the context of the in in the in the colonized space when colonized space is jokhon christianity ashe seta kibhabe evolved ho this is something that is there in chino achieve steps so we find people coming up and accepting the religion and how this religion actually destroys the igbo community or 
destroys the pillars of belief that when we find that when the uh, when in when Oponko kills one of the messengers kills one of the messengers the others the other three and then they run away nobody in the clan gets hold of them and uh, nobody gets hold of them and kills and takes revenge of the of the disrespect that the europeans had so shown to okonko and all the all the elderly people of the tribe that is, at the end of the story we find that the okonko and the elderly people of the tribe go uh, are invited in the in the office of the commissioner they are they are uh, captured and they are humiliated and they are forced not to do not to question the might of the lord the might of the whites they come back and uh, okonko was expecting a war people are being called and at that time the messenger comes in the messenger comes with a with a notice that you cannot hold a meeting here and uh, okonko kills the messenger the other three runs away and okonko says at that moment i realized that this community was breaking so the question that how things fall apart due to colonialism is visible it is through the it is through the introduction of the religion that the people gets the entire uh, community gets gets destroyed so okonko who who still who still cannot accept it had had no has no other way but to commit suicide and the end who who follows the and this this suicide is actually because he still has to live up to that concept of masculinity which is and which was an integral part of the igbo identity from the very beginning of the text we find that okonko suffers from a kind of or suffers from a kind of uh, uh, complex of a kind of an anxiety because he doesn't want to be like the father he doesn't want to be like the father and therefore he takes up this masculinity and and this masculinity which is which is which borders on violence he hits his wife he hits his sons he cut and daughters so there is a kind of a violence that is there connected with uh, with the igbo identity and even that is that chinu achibi looks at that so chinu achibi's way of looking at the uh, the narrator if you look at the narrator of chinu achibi's things for that part he takes a kind of a broad view he does not take sides he just looks at the situation as it evolves over time so this is interesting the chinuachi this way of looking at uh, the igbo community and its development and its destruction and its evolution and what happens to the place after during the colonial times is is interesting and it gives us a complex view of colonialism so uh, this is what uh, what we find in colonialism how uses france for no's concept of uh, how the native changes can be seen in the character of uh, in the character of okonko's son what happens with, to him when he is exposed to christianity colonized countrymen are somehow yeah you cannot have there was a kind of a consent yes there was a kind of a consent and this consent that was a, that is what i want you to say yes yeah, as shohini says that so in his question was was there a kind of a consent of the colonizer colonized due to which the colonizer became powerful yes but this consent was created by the discourse of orient of the orient এই জন্য ওরিয়েন্টেড ডিসকোর্সটা খুব ইম্পর্টেন্ট এই ডিসকোর্সটা শুধু কলোনাইজার মানতো না ইট ওয়াজ ইট ওয়াজ ইন্ট্রোডিউসড এমং দ্য কলোনাইজড অলসো থ্রু আ স্কুল এডুকেশন মনে রাখতে হবে ম্যাকাওলে ম্যাকাওলে ইন্ট্রোডিউসেস ইংলিশ এডুকেশন ইন ইন্ডিয়া ফর এক্সাম্পল অ্যান্ড দ্যাস ইংলিশ দোজ হু ওয়ার স্টার্টিং ইন দ্যাট স্কুল ওয়াজ গ্রো ওয়াজ 
was introduced to the system of education, British education, where internalizing the concept of the Orient within himself and, and repeating it. So in this way, colonization happened both with power as well as with concept. And in Things Fall Apart, we find exactly that. How a group of the group of people among the Igbo tribe decides to give up their own customs and rituals and take up a foreign religion. And that leads to a destruction of the community. It was not something that happened with power. It was the force of the idea of the Orient, the force of the idea of the colonizer that led to this, led to this power structure. So uh, this is one way. The, so this is when we look at things fall apart. In things fall apart, we have. If we move on, there are other three. In, in, in other three, te, in other two texts, we'll find how the how Africa evolves during the post-colonial times. During, during the colonial times, and how it it, it it changes. It changes. The community breaks down. There's a breakdown of the ethos of the community, and it becomes a hybrid space. That is what, uh, and how. Christianity engages with the native self is something that is very, very distinctly uh, interesting to know. Even, and in, what I find interesting in Tunoyati is he's talking about Nigeria, where, where one of the major religion is Islam. But there is hardly reference to it. We have both the native religions as well as uh, Christianity. He focuses on the on the interaction between the Christian between Christianity and the primitive religions, the uh, the tribal religions. So that is something that is of consequence. Now, uh, moving on to the post-colonial thought. Uh, so this is the text that we have now. As I said earlier in the in the class, that post-colonial is not equal or is not synonymous with post. Uh, post independence or or after colonialism it refers to it base it 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 is it is it refers to the structures it basically refers to the structures that was established by colonialism and 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 its continuation so post colonialism or the text that we consider to be post-colonialism might not be limited to the colonial interactions or to the space where colonized, where there was a where there is a kind of a colonial involvement. Even after colonialism, even after the countries got independence, the impact of colonialism was visible. The impact of colonialism was visible in the form of the structures that were still embedded in the culture of the in the culture with this in this with this idea uh, of of post of, of the post colonial uh, what what how to deal with those uh, the spaces which have which were which have become free of colonial power but yet yet had the colonial uh, colonial structures embedded in it we need to look at uh, the uh, the short novella that we have written by gabriel garcia marquez uh, no one writes to the colonel no one writes to the colonel uh, is an uh, is a text which you, which you have if you have read it is set in colombia and this and the time that we are talking about is uh, is not during the spanish invasion of the place but almost after that when this this place was marked by a kind of a, was ravaged by uh, uh, by civil war was ravaged by civil war and the structure uh, and we here we find the story of no one rise to the colonel is the story of hardship, of penury, of hunger that an old man faces because 
of a structure of exploitation and uh, that was that was a legacy of colonialism spanish colonialism legacy was hardcore exploitation mass murder hunger lack of development this if we look at the legacy this was the legacy that was left to the was given to the colombia the colombians it was given to the latin american countries at the wake of colonialism now i would garcia gabriel garcia marquez eta porar age i would request you to just have a look at the noble speech of gabriel garcia marquez that noble that he had given which which you can well connect so he in in that in that uh, noble speech he talks about uh, the myth of el dorado with which we connect colombia we hardly know anything about colombia we know one thing but we many th many many things uh, we hardly know anything about colombia but one thing that we know is about that el dorado myth and he says that this el dorado myth led to the spanish invasion of colombia and and major exploitation so a group of people got powerful exploited and tortured the people so this structure was is was we find that even after this colonial the colonialism was even after it got freedom colombia got freedom this very structure was was continued to be there even the, it was marked by a fight between the uh, for power between the conservatives and the liberal thousand days war which is the background of no one dies of the colonel colonel was the, was a member of this thousand days war he he took part and he and it took him great efforts to get hit get his efforts recognized to get his participation recognized we find that he took 15 years for him to find uh, to to be recognized as a freedom fighter and even after that he is waiting for that paper to come with after uh, which would give him a kind of a pension in the meantime he is subjected to abject poverty in a nation which is marked by a kind of a similar structure of domination so we are here typically in a post colonial space but the impact of colonialism in the form of the structure of the domination and the dominator is still there so there is there is no change so uh, post colonialism is not merely about the critiquing of the colo colonial impact during the time of colonialism but the after effect which remains here in here in no one dies to the colonel in the form of uh, what we call in the form of uh, corruption in the form of uh, the military rule we have reference to curfews country curfews continuously and also to the uh, and also to the fact that after colonialism the problems never got solved because it still remained in the margins colombia still remained in the margins no one knew about them no one knew about uh, what was happening there so it was and unless you are unless the problem gets visible the problems are not solved and the problems are not visible because it is it it, it is not a country in europe so it is in the margins so question of the margins the question of being uh, being not in the in power is raised here in one of the sections where colonel is talking with his doctor uh, he's he's referring to how the europeans look at like latin america this is a wonderful way that even even after colonialism how colombia is still exoticized the nature of the way of looking at colombia hasn't changed he, he says to the european south america is a man with a mustache a guitar and a gun 
So this is how we imagine South. See the 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 stereotype type image of a South American. A South American is a man with a mustache. Tarada gop thakta hobe, tarha tarada guitar thakta hobe, tarada gun thakta. So every so this is the generalization. The doctor said, laughing over his newspaper, they don't understand the problem. And Colonel says the best thing would be for the Europeans to come over here and for us to go to Europe. That way everybody would know what's happening in his own country. So this is what this is the problem that even after colonialism, Colombia remains on the margins. So the very uh, Gabriel Garcia's work is an attempt to bring those issues to look at the complexity, the dynamics of the space of Colombia after colonial, colonial, colonization and how the, uh, how the structures continue to be there, continue to be there by the abject hunger. If we look at the novel, it's a novel about the hunger, about exploitation that, he, that, colonial, that the colonial has to face. Uh, and it is, uh, and and which is actually a result of the colonial exploitation before and the legacy of colonialism. So, uh, in that sense of the term, no one rise to the colonial, though is not based on a kind of a colonial atmosphere, but yet it is it is uh, it is a text which critiques the structures of colonialism which has which still prevails which still prevails over the time which still prevails and leads to a kind of an exploitation which leads a kind of a discrimination in the in the society of colonial so in that way uh, no one rights to the colonial can be considered uh, and is considered as a post colonial text So, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, in this way, we are so moving from things fall apart. So, things fall apart is situated during colonial times. So, it is directly we can have a picture of the structure because the structure is imposed by the colonizers who are present. But in case of no one rights to the colonizer, no one rights to the colonial, we have the structure present without, though the colonizers have left the space. So this is uh, the way. So this is all. This is this is also the thrust area of postcolonialism as we read it today. Because in 21st century, we are not talking about. We will not find countries being colonized by other countries, but we we will still be looking at the consequences of that colonialism still continuing. So this is also a thrust area of post-colonial post-colonial studies, standing in 21st century. Now moving on to the 21st in 21st century, we, another thing that becomes very important is, uh, as we will will refer one another text that has been included interestingly in the in this in this section is the poetry of Mamang Dai, the Aruna the uh, the Arunachal. Uh, the poet, the poet is from Arunachal Pradesh, uh, a, 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 a state in India which is uh, which which is hardly recognized by the mainland, uh, about which we hardly have any idea, and uh, for whom the concept of when we imagine a nation uh, in India, there has been a, there. There has been a after independence. We have a uh, we still continue to have a kind of a uh, discrimination between the people of the mainland and people belonging to the northeast and northeast. And so, therefore, northeast still remains a kind of a uh, kind of a space about which we hardly know the amount of knowledge that we have about a place in Delhi, we hardly have that kind of a uh, 
concept about Arunachal Pradesh. So here also, if we look in Indian context, the same thing is happening. The concept of the center and the margin, the powerful and the powerless, still exist in the form of the way we look at the states. We who belong to the mainland almost are, are belong to the center of this nation. For us, nation is something else. Why for a person deciding Arunachal Pradesh, the concept of nation is something different. So, and there is a difference. We, we, though we belong to the same nation, we call ourselves Indians. We hardly know about them. So there is a kind of a distancing. There is, there is a kind of an otherization that is there. So one important concern in postcolonial study is this otherization. And this very otherization is visible in case of, in, in case of uh, the treatment that we do with the, with the Northeast, Northeastern people. And Mamandai actually brings into this, talks about this in one of his uh, one of her essays, he talks about the way we look at Arunachal Pradesh and how, what, whenever we write about Arunachal Pradesh, we write in two ways. First, we talk about it as a place of immense natural beauty. It's like that primitive space, the way the Europeans used to look up, write about the Indians, about as an exotic place. We still talk about Arunachal Pradesh as an exotic place, a place where you might go and spend a weekend, do a kind of a trekking up the Hima, up the mountains, see the snow clad mountains come down. That is what, so it, Arunachal Pradesh exists in travel booklets. It exists in like a seven day, eight nights package, seven night, eight days package. That is what we actually know about. Or, so this is one way of looking at Arunachal Pradesh. The other way of looking at Arunachal Pradesh is a place which is marked by, uh, by infiltration, by, uh, by uh, political unrest, by tribal fights. So kind of a it's a place which is under political turmoil. So either it is looked as a kind of a heaven on earth kind of a thing and or, or, or we have another concept it is a place which is like it is a heaven in danger so amidst this what gets silenced is the real culture of arunachal pradesh a culture which is which talks about a union of nature and man a place where myths involve both man and nature. It talks about a kind of a world view where human beings are just a part, is, is, are a part of a greater species world. And give, it gives us a world view. Uh, and it, it, it is a world where you have local myths regarding uh, which connects human beings with nature, with mountains, with rivers, and gives us a more eco-friendly, eco-critical, eco-friendly way of existence, which becomes very important. And uh, this, and Mamang Dai, while she's, she's talking about the local meets in her poems in the mountains, if you look at the silence of the mountains or the, uh, the other poem that you have, you find that how the, he, she imagines the nature as something that is living, something that is living that is uh, uh, that has an impact on us, that is interact that that is something that's interacting with us. So we are accustomed to it. We are, we we are not. So it's not a world where the Namangdai's poetic world is a world where human beings are not at the center. Now, this is a is an essentially post-colonial way of looking at uh, look post-colonial worldview in the sense from sense of uh, I will here refer to one book that is a wonderful read, that, and that book is. Uh, 
Amitabha Ghosh, The Great Derangement, a book called The Great Derangement written by Amitabha Ghosh. And in this book, we find that she, what Amitabha Ghosh talks about is the fact that he talks about the colonial rule and how this colonial rule, one part of the book is about how the colonial rule in India has led to a led to a destruction of an ecological consciousness that was always present in us. He talks about the cities of Bombay, the city of Bombay, and how the, if you look at Bombay, the Bombay was created as a result of colonial enterprise after the colonial introduction. So it is a colonial city if we look at both Calcutta and Bombay. And we find that he says before colonialism, Nobody used to stay on the, uh, the the natives or the clans that were there, never used to stay near the beach because they believe that staying near the beach can be dangerous because Arabian Sea can, they had a kind of a native idea, a kind of a uh, basic idea within them that this place is not suitable for me. So they used to stay in the mid, in the uh, away from the sea in the midland. But if you look at colonialism, we have now the structures being built. Bombay, a kind of a port city, was established, and one of the biggest cities. And now, standing in 21st century, the ecologists, the geologists, talk about Arabian Sea becoming turbulent over time. And it would be so turbulent that the entire Bombay, I can be under the scare, there is, a, there is a real scare of being, this entire city getting destroyed. So this colonization according to, uh, according to Amitabha Ghosh brings a kind of a dissociation between culture and nature and man becoming the center of everything. So, he introduces this, he, he, he does not introduce this, but he uses the term called Anthropocene. So this is a world where Amitabha Ghosh says, the human beings are not merely an important part, but they are become a geological force. They are, they are using, they are, they are, they're putting a kind of an impact on nature, which is irreversible. So nature, human beings have become a geological force and they have become this because of their dissociation with nature. That is a legacy of colonialism. And when Maman Dai in, his, in her poems, okay. yeah, Iqbal, uh, yeah, do you have something to say? Okay, so when Maman Dai talks about uh, the, the, uh, the, about the local needs, about the na about nature, about the way how the Arunachal, the life of the Arunachal the people are connected with nature, integrally connected with nature. How each other influenced them. We find a kind of a post-colonial streak attached to it. So in this way, though again, again, uh, this inclusion of this text becomes extremely relevant when we do post-colonial studies in 21st century. And, uh, and this text uh, does not, uh, though does not fall into so-called colonial texts, the so-called so-called canonized texts that uh, that are there in the field of colonial study, post-colonial studies, but yet it becomes a very important entry and uh, and this in this in this in the syllabus. And we can really read it from a post-colonial perspective. Now, so we are here moving from the post-colonial in the sense of a critique of the colonial times to a critique of the colonial structure, which remains even after colonialism ends, to, uh, just hold on, to a kind of an uh, critique of the kind of an ecological uh, kind of an uh, a kind of an uh, concept of ecology which uh, 
or ecology that that was a legacy of colonialism and that is being critiqued by mamangdai so we are actually we see that post colonialism is not one thing now in 21st century post colonialism includes has evolved as a as a as a form of inquiry which are which are multi which is multi directional and uh, we have uh, bill ashcroft while writing uh, his uh, when he when he is talking about this post colonialism in 21st century he uses a term that post colonialism is rhizomic in structure rhizome is like a rhizome rhizome bodhe almost adar moto ada jodi dekho adar छोट छोट नारेटिवेंट डमेशन जो डमिनेशन होते एक्सप्लेशन होते विभिन्न रकम डिफरेंट प्रोबेबलि when uh, and probably when we are when we'll be doing post colonial studies in 21st century we will look into till other newer when we have a wider horizon uh, open to us because we have we are not critiquing merely colonialism and the impact of colonialism but we are critiquing the tendency of this exploitation this entire structure of the exploited and the exploiter or we are we are we are critiquing this entire structure of the center and the periphery and wherever there is a structure of the center and periphery we will critique it we will interrogate it and we will try to analyze the different ways in which the periphery interacts with the center and the ways in which center impacts interacts with the periphery that should be the thrust of post colonial studies in 21st century i guess i have taken up lot of time and your patience thanks for your patience for listening to me uh, i guess we can stop here today uh, and taking some questions partho if you have some yes thank you obijit it was wonderful listening to you Tracing post-colonialism back to its originary point and bringing it up to the 21st century, it was a momentous job, but you have done it wonderfully. Thank you so much. I think there are many lacunas, but I guess you will know about this. But within one and a half hour, it will. I must thank the students for being so patient throughout the whole thing. So, if you have any questions, you can please. Well, I now request uh, Srimati Koel Ganguly uh, to kindly begin the interactive session. Thank you, Parthoda. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for your insightful, nuanced, uh, excellent, intimate lecture. So, uh, some of our students had asked questions, uh, which you have already addressed. But there are others uh, asking questions in the YouTube link. So, I'm putting them to you. Priti Rakshit, student of fourth semester, UG. She is asking a question. How is literature a strategy for post-colonial survival? How is literature? Literature has always been a way through which, if we look at, uh, has always been a potent tool through which colonialism has disseminated, disseminated, circulated its view. So when in, in From when we take a post-colonial stance, the first thing that we need to is to look at this the ways of 
So the first thing we need to do is to critique this kind of uh, literary representations and the way of writing back to wait. We, uh, in, we can all uh, the, uh, and a way of getting back to the colonialism, as famously it has been said, that empire can actually get be, get back at the colonizers by writing it back and writing it back with vengeance, as it, as it has been said. So literature is a dominant tool uh, while exerting the colonial power as well as critic as well as a critique of the colonial power. And we see that even that day, that is why we are actually reading post-colonialism as an entire paper, both in UT and PZ. So it is also a matter of academic interest. Okay, I thank guess. You. Yes, thank you, sir. Her second question is, is there any difference between post-colonialism with a hyphen and without a hyphen? Oh, there has been much talk about it and much dispute about it. So in a way, we can say that post-colonial, one is, one talks about uh, a kind of a temporal, kind of a different, it's, it's something that is temporal, post-colonial, and something that the another thing that deals with a kind of a thought process, as I said, as a structure. My my preference has always been for the post-colonial without the hyphen. Thank you, sir. Uh, now interestingly, I'll add to it when Bill Ashcroft in the in literature of our times in a collection of essays, he talks about he prefers post-colonial with the hyphen, as he says that did. This actually shows a kind of a rhizomic nature of the uh, post-colonial uh, of the post-colonial studies. It, it, it as it, as if it, as it's offrooting, it's a kind of a rhizomic structure. So uh, there is a debate about whether what we should use. Thank you, sir. Now I want to uh, know your opinion about uh, whether India is obsessed with English medium education. If yes, then is it a post-colonial hangover? How will you uh, see to this? Uh, initially, first, as we said, uh, again, we'll again, again here come to, uh, if we, uh, for, uh, first of all, again, we get, if we get back to France, Fenno here and feel that English, the English studies is a legacy of initially what the, uh, what after is a legacy of the minutes of Macaulay and the introduction of English education. And it led to an entire group of uh, uh, people who were educated in English, who were educated in, uh, in English medium and imbibed the ideas of English, idea of the Europeans, idea of the Western philosophy, Western thought. Uh, the influence we find, we find the influence of this even in the names during the, uh, in the early part of the 18th century, where they write their names also in an anglicized form. We have an anglicized group of people in case of Michael Madhusudan Dutt or Kuruchar and Dutt. So th this entire, so that was one influence. So now with time, the influence of uh, English language, and we need to remember that English language is, has been there with us for a long time. And as Raja Rao or uh, Arkan Arayan, has said that English has is is over the time has been a part of our consciousness, and as wonderfully I, I still remember what it's very interestingly Arkanarayan says that uh, English is is has an unmistakably Swadeshi stamp over it nowadays as a, a as a Swadeshi stamp over it, and we use English like a Lancashire cotton. Uh, uh, we visit like a dhoti that is made out of a Lancashire cotton. So that was an interesting way of you of of Indianized Indian English uh, that has that was there during our Canadian times. Now coming to our twenty first century, English is indeed a kind of a language which has uh, which has a kind of an international coinage, and it has ceased to become a kind of a colonizer's language anymore, but a language which is, uh, which has evolved over the time to be a world language. And uh, there is, it, it, it has shredded off a kind of a colonial legacy 
and has become one of the Indian languages in, 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 in many of the ways. Thank you, sir. As Kamala Das says in her poem and introduction, this is my language. I can write yes. in it, uh, notwithstanding the, you know, the suggestions of the relatives and friends and the society. Uh, so, in, in continuance of this discussion, uh, do you think that the inclusion of uh, the new literature or Indian literature in English and the translation studies in the UG and the PG syllabus of the Indian universities, uh, do you think this to be a process of uh, decolonization? This is, is this an honest uh, effort of decolonization intellectually? Because uh, even in our days, the syllabus was more oriented with the British literature or uh, to some extent the American literature. But in our days, we never uh, got a syllabus like this. So we read uh, these uh, parts who are personal interest. But uh, I want to uh, ask your opinion or your opinion regarding this. Actually, reading English in a post-colonial space is itself a kind of a uh, it's a process of a negotiation and renegotiation with a kind of a tendency of canonization. Right. We have, a, in our times, we had a very canonized form of, uh, we did not deviate from the canon much when it comes to the, uh, bring, uh, of in, in, when it came to making syllabuses for studies in UG and PG syllabus. But over the time, there has been an increasing thrust toward post-colonial, towards culture studies. So we, uh, and many of the departments have uh, considered English, the English department considered to be more of a culture studies department than English. English, And this is, I guess it's very, this is, this is, uh, this is the right way to go because it is a way of resisting to a kind of any kind of structure that the Eurocentric thought puts on us. So because we, and it is also a way of claiming our space in the field of English studies by incorporating our, uh, our texts through translation. We need to, this comes with first that acceptance that English is a global language and you cannot uh, do away with it. I believe that Derrida would not have been Derrida if Gayatri Chakraborty Spiva wouldn't have translated him. Into the impact that it has on the world is mainly is in a way due to the translation that that which Chakrabarty did. So in this way, we have there is an acceptance of the fact that English is a global language, but at the same time, there is an accept there is also an an acceptance of the necessity that we need to incorporate a kind of a translation, an act of translation through which we can incorporate our indigenous studies our elements the text of that 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 explains us explain, explains our our complexity and those texts should be incorporated and with that desire with that need we have a kind of a change in the way we have created our syllabus so this change i think is for the good thank you sir professor patrapati mondon has a question i will uh, request him to interact with you uh, thank you, Obhijitda, for this wonderful lecture. So, our question is that we have to do this department. 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 We have uh, net set a crack cot the pare, halo cot the pare, tie sheta yami to up naked bolt the chairman, evaporate to the ball and halo high student the pocket. This is uh, uh, thank you, Putin, for the question. Part of the question. Uh, the way Jibabe net Akon Hotse was not the way when we used to be. Uh, we, we, we sat for our net. So Things have changed over time. At the MCQ, they to us MCQ type they to go It has become, uh, in a way, difficult as well as simple. Both, I mean, in case of English literature, I feel English literature at MCQ can be dangerous because But last act, the pattern, I'm 
there has been what what one minute and accolade the syllabus to hold the cbc is i feel is uh, one should first take up that syllabus and read it thoroughly purota mane even those that je je jekhane all jekhane choice ache sei choice er text gulo porte hobe because every uh, there are texts which uh, the questioners the, 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 the people who make the questions have affinity towards তো সেইগুলো ম্যাক্সিমামই সিলেবাস গুলো থাকে সেই সিলেবাসের টেক্সট গুলো ভালো করে পড়া থিওরি গুলোর সেই টেক্সট গুলোর বেসিক নলেজটা দরকার সো উই নিড এ কাইন্ড অফ থরো রিডিং অফ দ্য টেক্সট রিডিং নিডস আই গেস দিস ইজ দ্য ওনলি ওয়ে থ্রু হুইচ উই এই মোর উই রিড দ্য দ্য বেসিক টেক্সট আমাদের একটা টেক্সট না পড়ার যে একটা অভ্যেস হচ্ছে আর সেটা সেমেস্টারে হতে বাধ্য অনেক ক্ষেত্রে এইটুকুন সময় এতগুলো টেক্সট অনেক সময় পড়া যায় বাট কিন্তু যখন নেট করতে হবে বিকজ ভেতর থেকে আমি দেখছি লাইন তুলে কোয়েশ্চেন করছে উইচ ইজ আই ফিল কাইন্ড অফ ইটস ইরেশনাল টু দ্য কোর সো ইউ আর নট এ ডিকশনারি মার্কিং আপ থিংস সো আই এম নট ভেরি কমফোর্টেবল উইথ দ্য ওয়ে নেট নেট এক্সাম ইজ টিক বাট দ্য ওনলি ওয়ে ইজ টু রিড দ্য টেক্সট গেট হোল্ড অফ দ্য টেক্সট রিড ইট থরলি অ্যান্ড Uh, as well as the theory the theory becoming is becoming very important and solving the questions would, would also not help you it is to help in our times but it is it is not going to help nowadays also so reading the text following two or three universities basically delhi university and bombay university their syllabus set up to dekha along with amade uh, the syllabus set up the syllabus set she takes you at the jayga kore পিরিয়ডাইজেশন করে ইচ পিরিয়ডের যে টেক্সটগুলো সবখানে আছে নিয়ে সেগুলো পড়ে রেখে দেওয়া অ্যান্ড নাও ইউ গো ইউ ডু এ কাইন্ড অফ এ টিক ট্যাক টো থিং অর ইউ নো অ্যান্ড ইফ ফেট ইজ হ্যাপি ইউ আর সাকসেসফুল আদারওয়াইজ ইউর নলেজ ইনক্রিজ ইজ সো বোথ ওয়েজ ইউ আর এ গেম থ্যাংক ইউ দাদা থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার রিকোয়েস্টিং মাই esteemed colleagues to put their questions if they have any okay i think uh, then i am ending ending this interactive session thank you sir over to back to sharathidar thank you yes Uh, that was a wonderful interactive session i now request professor k r khoto to deliver the vote of thanks and the valedictory address good afternoon to all respected uh, patron patron chief patron of, of this lecture series my dear uh, research person my dear colleagues and my dear students just now the cruel hand of time has forced us to come back into the reality of life to remind us the famous line of shakespearean sonnet that to quote and every fear from fear sometime declines and for after coming back into the real world at first on behalf of the department of english at baharampur girls college i would like to thank our dishes person professor obhijit bhattacharya assistant professor department of english navagram amorchan kundu college uh, for giving us the wonderful taste of being post colonial in 21st century i extend my deep regards to dr boishali hui our patron of this lecture series and professor and head of the department of english of university of kollani for enriching us with our valuable introductory address i am grateful to dr hena shina chief patron of this online lecture series and principal of our college for her cordial welcome address uh, i am highly obliged to all members of iqsc for their continuous support and guidance and, uh, i would like to express with uh, my wonderful gratitude uh, to our head of the department Uh, dr patsh patsh sharuti guho and our esteemed colleagues uh, 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 professor parthvoti mondol professor vinay dangar 
professor dr uh, ikbal ansari professor koel ganguli and professor uh, kajol kumar saha for their cooperation and tiring help and sincere effort to make this lecture series successful my special thanks go to teaching and non teaching brothers and sisters of bhairampur girls college family uh, for their uh, continuous support i want to thank ashikanto uh, boshak for his heart and soul dedication to offer uh, his technical assistant to make this lecture series successful thanks are due to my dear students for their paying attention to understand the taste of this lecture series at last thanks a lot to all once again thank you so much yadi thank you obj thank you thank you thanks for inviting me and it was an interesting session thank you thank you thank you students for listening bearing with me for such a long time thank you kid thank you dr thank you dr to everybody thank you sikanto da thank you so i can leave i guess dr yes yes yes